So I always tell when I talk to student groups or, or uh, I always say, hey, if you're coming into the HVAC industry, look at building modeling, understand building modeling, look at controls, continuous commissioning. Because you designed that building one way, is it still operating that way? And is everything operating or was the secretary on the third floor cold and somebody wired the outside air damper shut and we never un undid that, which has always happened in the history of air conditioning. It's always happened. So, you know, people have done shortcut things when, when something breaks and, and then they forget about it or that guy leaves or he goes off shift or he goes gets a better job and, and no one knows about it. So continuous commissioning of buildings, uh, having controls, having good modeling. Good afternoon. So um, I'm Mark Fly. Uh, I actually work for Aon, and so um, I have this title called Executive Director. That really just means I'm old and I'm getting ready to retire. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so mostly what I do is I go around and talk to, to, uh, to ASHRAE groups. And so uh, this talk is my opinion, therefore I can't be wrong. But, uh, but it, I, I've been working with, this really came out of, uh, a couple of different things. Number one, I was asked to talk at the DCARB conference in, in Washington, D.C. here in a couple of months. They gave me a whole 15 minutes. I can't do, you know, like jo Thomas Jefferson said, I didn't have time to write you a short letter. So uh, I can't hardly do 15 minutes. So this is the long version of what I'm going to do in, in, in uh, Washington. <clears throat> the other, other part of this is um, I've been sitting on an HRI committee called the System Steering Committee for, for about 12 years. And we've been work, working on some of the topics here. And I blatantly stole slides from, from some guys that worked on that. Dick Lord, who's currently chair of 90.1. Drake Irby, who's been very active in 90.1. So uh, a, a lot of this content isn't my original content, but I've been hanging out with those guys. and. We've been trying to figure out how to do this. So anyway, this is an ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer. That means your, your president gets extra brownie points for me showing up. Um, and the DL program is sponsored by Society. We're in the Society headquarters. And it's, uh, it's sponsored by one of the members council committees called the Chapter Technology Transfer Committee, uh, which is all the regional RVCs of chapter technology transfer. So all the regional vice chairmen of chapter of basically programs for the chapters sit on that committee. And typically, ASHRAE funds uh, the transportation costs. The chapter picks up ground costs uh, because my company pays for me to go around and talk to people. Uh, I'm free, so therefore, I'm very popular. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it's, it's a great, great program. And when I retire, they, they may have to start paying for me if somebody quits. Uh, the other thing, and you heard a plea earlier, get involved in ASHRAE. I have been involved. I've been an ASHRAE member, I say, since 1982. ASHRAE says, says since 1985 because I let my dues lapse for one year when I was out of a job in 84. <laughs> but uh, I went to my first ASHRAE Society meeting in, in uh, Dallas in 1986. I haven't missed one since. Uh, it's a great organization. I was just up there with Tony walking down the Wall of Presidents. I know almost half of them. Uh, it's a very tight community. I always say there's only two dozen people in the HVAC industry, and we all know each other. So uh, get involved in your local chapter. Get involved at the society level. Uh, I guarantee you, you and your company will get more out of it than you put in it. It always happens that way. So, <clears throat> And there are lots of things you can get involved with. Uh, uh, lots of technical committees, writing handbooks, writing journals for the article. All, all those uh, things are, are happening at the society level and in the chapters. So, <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about is... Basically, where are we at on energy efficiency based from a regulatory standpoint? And since I'm an equipment manufacturer, I'm a little equipment centric, so I'm going to talk a lot about SEER and IER and those kind of things. <clears throat> and where, where are we going to go forward and how are we really going to save carbon in buildings or really use less energy in, in our buildings? And, and what we're doing isn't going to get us there. So <clears throat> there is a Something that's happening that's going to happen in, in a few years, in my opinion, it's, it's already 
hit on water-cooled chillers, and probably in somewhere 2029 or shortly thereafter, we're going to hit it on unitary equipment, is that we're going to hit max tech. When we get, like on a water-cooled chiller, we are currently on the best in the market. We are one degree approach on the water, on the condenser side, one degree approach on the evaporator side. That means there's one degree difference between the suction temperature and the leaving water temperature, one degree difference between the uh, <coughs> um, condenser water and the condensing temperature. To get another half a degree, we gotta put 100 times more copper in that, and we're gonna get a few tenths of a percent more efficiency. So, you know, there's just, we're just, we're, we're, we've hit max tech. <clears throat> that's, not, that's not what's keeping us from saving energy. It's, it's, it's more about how do we design this equipment, how we operate it. So, um, <clears throat> and then to do what we really need to do, we've got to develop some additional tools and some additional technology that, quite frankly, we don't have today. So all the young people in the room, especially those people that are working uh, in, in building modeling or other things, there is lots of work to do. That's a great place to be. If you're in controls or commissioning, that's a great place to be. So, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about you know, uh, buildings. You've probably seen this slide uh, 100 times. 44% of commercial energy is consumed uh, by HVAC uh, systems. Um, <clears throat> And, and uh, you know, as buildings of HVAC efficiency continues to grow, but, but our plug loads and other things also grow along with it. And, and we have tried to regulate uh, the efficiency of equipment for, well, HRI has been regulating UNT equipment for over 60 years. Uh, U.S. Department of Energy has only been regulating things on a federal level since 2013. That's just because how, that's how long it took them to get around to it. Uh, they were too busy eliminating incandescent light bulbs and some other stuff. But uh, uh, so, so a big part of it's going into HVAC equipment. And, and to do that, we have used some metrics that over the years, EER, SEER, and IER, uh, uh, IPLV for chillers, certain, certain very simple metrics that were developed years and years ago. <coughs> And, and one of the things about simple metrics is they drive certain behaviors. So I always tell people in my business, and you know, I've been in the manufacturing side for almost 40 years of HVAC equipment, we know a whole lot about what our equipment does at four data points. And we don't know much else. I'll be real honest with you because um, because IER or SEER is developed off of four idealized data points. We spend all our time because how we sell equipment, how you guys select equipment if you're a consulting engineer, is by who's got the best SEER, who's got the best IER. So we optimize that equipment to match, uh, to, to, I probably ought to get close to the mic, uh, to match those, those efficiency ratings. So. We have equipment that runs really good at 25, 50, 75, and 100% uh, load at 95 degree ambient, 80, 67 indoor uh, conditions, and that's not where buildings run. And we, we uh, now we have made some progress. We went from EER at full load efficiency, because you design a building using 1% or less date weather data. So you know, you're designing a building for equipment that's optimized. When we were just using single EER metrics, we're designing buildings that were optimized to run only 1% of the time during the year, if you happen to be in that, that uh, particular weather condition that was 95 ambient. <clears throat> so if you kind of look at the history of, of, of 90.1 and, and how we've progressed, you can see that we've come a long way back, back from, uh, from the, you know, 1975 basically through 1980, and we keep progressing down, <coughs> uh, and, and and this is the kind of the slope that we've we've gone. So this is kind of where the energy standards in 90.1 have gone. If we if we look at what's happened with a three-ton residential unit. <coughs> 
And the red dots down at the very bottom is, is the prediction if we just kind of follow that trend of keep going down. This is the residential equipment. And, and look what happened. Somewhere in the 1990s, we were making big jumps. We went from really not really great equipment, very low cost equipment, to something that got pretty efficient. And then the, the line's starting to flatten out here. You know, we're not making these big jumps, and we're not making these big jumps not because nobody wants to or it gets too expensive. We're just getting closer and closer to that low approach area. I can only put so much coil in here and, and get there. So it's getting very, very flat. <clears throat> if, we, if we add in there a 10 ton rooftop equipment, it looks very similar. We didn't make as big a jump. Uh, in the 90s, it's been more of a progression, but it's also flattening out, out uh, as we go. Now, when we get to water chillers, water chillers actually have gone flat. So like I said, water chillers are basically at max tech today. Day. The best in class water chillers are as good as you're going to get a water chiller to be. <clears throat> um, so if we look at the 90.1, and this is a, an, old, uh, an older slide, so it, so it doesn't quite come up to today, but if we look at, at those predictions and we want to get to zero uh, <clears throat> energy usage in 2030, which is one of those numbers we keep talking about, and we just extrapolate that down. If we were just relying on equipment efficiency, you know, we've got to uh, decrease that at a steeper rate than we've ever done before, going forward. And I don't, th and we're not going to be able to do that. So there, you know, <clears throat> so there's just certain things that 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 aren't happening here. So. That's kind of what's happening on where we're at today and what we're doing with the current metrics. Now let's look at one of the current metrics. And uh, I stole this chart from, from Dick Lord, who's done a bunch of work in 90.1 and, and uh, ASHRAE 205. But this is for uh, a commercial building in zone 4A, which happens to be Atlanta, and um, and happens to have a design, a summer design temperature around 95 degrees. You know, it actually has some humidity, which is uh, some of this. So, so if we look at the chiller IPLV points, that's the red line up there with that design condition there up at the very top. The blue dots and the red dots are where a building actually operates. And this, this happens to be, um, I don't remember what, I think this may be a hospital. But uh, there, there are a bunch of different th ch charts like this that the 90.1 committee has developed. And, um, and, and what you find is we're just barely touching. We just have a few operational hours that, that even touch that IPLV point. So we're not down in the midst of that pack. So we're not designing equipment that's really optimized for where the building runs most of the time. So how could we possibly save the most amount of carbon or the most amount of energy during the annual cycle if, if we're doing that? Because we've, we've set our bar a little bit too high. We're not really at those conditions. <clears throat> and you look at the design condition and this, there, it never even showed up that we hit that condition in this particular uh, set of data. So, so what we've got to do is we've got to change the paradigm and stop, stop looking at individual equipment products and start looking on a more holistic level at bigger uh, energy, looking at the not only uh, what the product does, but you know, what the building energy needs are, how the build, building uses that energy within it, and basically model the whole thing. So it's really gonna be very dependent on building modeling. And Chuck Gulledge, a few years ago when he was president, his presidential theme was about digital twins. This is all about digital twins. Now the problem is the digital twins today aren't very good. <clears throat> uh, the models just aren't, aren't you know, as we, as we do modeling of buildings and then we look at real data as buildings operating, including this building, which had probably some of the most experienced, smartest uh, people in the world designing, what we find is that we're not operating on the model. It doesn't really look like that. So, so there are, are some serious issues with that. And part of the reason is that we don't have good models of the equipment. 
So, so we've got to go from this kind of level one, which is where we're, we're kind of up at level two. So we've gone from EER and COP of, you know, just single point, full load energies. We've kind of come up into uh, combined load models uh, and, and IPLV and IER. We have a little bit of things like HRI guideline V, which talks about how do you do heat recovery? How do you figure out what the heat recovery uh, integrates with a mechanical system? How does that make the equipment model? <coughs> um, We've, we've done some regional annualized metrics on residential equipment, but we haven't really done regional metrics for commercial equipment. And what we found even in the residential equipment is what manufacturers can do is, you know, it's very hard for us to build a, as a manufacturer, I do, I do a low, I do a high select. I look for the highest efficiency and that's what I build my equipment to because I don't want to be involved with somebody bootlegging a, a air conditioner from Minnesota down to Texas. You know, and if, if any of you guys were around when we transitioned from 22 to, to 410, that was happening. People were bringing stuff across the Mexican border. <laughs> so, you know, we don't, you know, so even the best laid regulations really don't always work. Uh, so we've got some, so we're kind of halfway up this, but what we really need to do is develop better tools and modeling. <clears throat> now, and HRI, HRI certifies lots of different products, and DOE regulates a lots of different products. Does anybody know the one product in the HVAC space that DOE does not regulate? DOE does not regulate water chillers. The reason DOE does not regulate water chillers is uh, the, the authority for the U.S. Department of Energy to regulate products was derived from a law called EPAC, or EPCA, depending on how you want to pronounce it, the Energy Policy Act of 1975. It goes back a day or two, even before me. Not before I was born, but before I was active. <laughs> but before many of you were born. And so when the U DOE was created, Congress passed a law called the Energy Policy Act and said, DOE, go forth and save energy. And here is a list of products that you can address. And it had light bulbs. It had electric motors. It had washing machines. It had dishwashers, which is why your dishwasher doesn't dry your dishes as good as the, the old ones used to. Uh, why you can't buy an incandescent light bulb. It had unitary air conditioners. It had fans. It had compressors. It did not have water chillers. They left it off the list. And to get it on the list, Congress has to pass a law. And Congress doesn't pass laws very easily, so therefore we've never regulated water chillers and no one really knows that we're going to. But then strangely enough, on the HRI side, the one guy that actually has the best data on the full map of performance at all operating conditions of any of the HVAC products is water chillers. Because HRI decided about, and Dick Lord, who's chair 90.1, was a big part of this, uh, decided, that committee decided that, that they wanted to do a little bit better uh, job of certifying their products. And so now when you cert get a HRI certified water chiller, you, you get an IPLV point, or uh, you get those four data points, but what HRI is certifying is not the IPLV points, it's the software that, dry, that calculates those. So the selection software for that chiller has to produce those four IPLV points and they test a random point. And I've, I've certified chillers in my lifetime and I can tell you the random point is somewhere in the corner. If you said that chiller will run at 70 degree discharge temperature and 35 degrees outside, that's the point they will to ask you to test at. Uh, um, it'll be some weird combination and you have to hit everything in that envelope within. Now, what they do do is normally HRI certification is plus or minus 5% on those IPLV points or IER or SEER. When you get out to the fringes, they give you up to 15% tolerance because you're, you're way out there. Uh, but 15% is better than I don't know. 
I have no idea. <clears throat> and, uh, and actually, there is a lot of more in, in uncertainty as you get out uh, uh, wider ranges of operations. So, uh, so that's the one product we do have that. But we've got to develop more models uh, for equipment that are better for other types of HVAC equipment. And we're just talking about the chiller. We're not talking about the air handler. We're not talking about coils, fan cool units, any of the things that go with the chiller, even cooling towers or, or, uh, are, are not included. So one of the big issues in any of this modeling from equipment standpoint side is water's easy. 500 times the GPM comes the delta T. That's the capacity, right? It's pretty simple stuff. Um, the capacity, if you have latent load and you're doing dehumidification with wet air across a coil, that's hard. Uh, and, and how much water you've got, you know, you, uh, you kind of know how the water is going to go through the chiller. You kind of don't know how the air is going to go through the coil, whether it's going to, you know, the, the airflow in the corner of the coil is not the same as the airflow in the middle of the coil. You got non-uniform airflow. You got non-uniform refrigerant distribution inside the coil. Uh, it's a very tough math modeling problem, and one that hasn't really been solved to everyone's satisfaction yet. And and so that's the reason, like I said, there's lots of work that can be done in ASHRAE in industry to to, to clean that up. So we've got to get where we model bigger, uh, more and more systems. And we've kind of got to get away from driving these four IPLV points on all this equipment with manufacturers. So it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing in my point of view, because uh, until the US Department of Energy or the market demands the data, manufacturers aren't going to provide the data because you know we, we also have a cost base. We're trying to sell equipment for the most reasonable cost. And, and we're going to provide what is asked for. We're not going to do extra. So <clears throat> until that demand gets built, but we also don't want DOE regulating how many BTUs per square foot per building with verification of your model for the next 10 years and fines associated with that unless the models we are pretty sure are pretty darn good. Uh, so, so until we can kind of get this developed, I, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be, take a while and it's going to be a struggle. So. So if we look at unitary equipment, what we have today is in the red box. So basically, we got a fan, a coil, we got a condensing unit, and we got compressors. That's all we're really looking at at this system. <clears throat> uh, if we went to the green box, and, and by the way, the, the fan isn't very well represented, because we, we've picked one point with a fan in that piece of equipment uh, for Today, it's a very low static pressure point. Uh, in 2026, you're going to see that come up a little bit. Or in probably in 2029 on commercial equipment, you're going to see it come up to something more reasonable. But it's still going to be a single point. It's not going to be your building point. <coughs> uh, so if we expand that out and we start talking about variable pressure drops in the, in the system, we talk, start talking about economizers that, that, we've talk, that are mandated on almost every equipment, uh, heat recovery and all that kind of thing. That's kind of the green box. And then the blue box is, let's look at the whole building as a system and how it operates and how, how it, it, it works. Because like I said, we've done a pretty good job, I think, on designing equipment that operates at four data points. What we haven't done a great job of is understanding how buildings operate how the controls need to integrate. Uh, and as we move into a world where we have variable speed everything, we have variable speed compressors, we have variable speed fans, condenser fans, variable speed evaporator fans, everything's variable. Variable water flow, everything's variable. At any given load point, indoor air condition, outdoor air condition, there is one speed on each one of those things that that minimizes energy. But, but as you change something, change the humidity coming in, or change the demand load, change the outdoor air temperature, change the outdoor air humidity conditions, that speed will change to something else. So, 
So as you hear people start talking about putting AI into control systems, that's a very good opportunity for that. Can this learn? Can I move this speed up 5% and say, did I get better or worse? And if I didn't, let's go the other way, right? And, and you can have learning systems that will learn the building and learn how the building operates over time. So there's lots of opportunities to do, do different things, but they're kind of out of our realm of the way we've always done it. <clears throat> if we look at chill water systems, uh, it's even worse because really all we're looking at is this, and my boxes are a little bit off, I noticed, but we're looking at one chiller, we're not looking at the cooling tower, we're not looking at the pumps, and we're not looking how it interacts with, with when you have multiple chillers, which typically in most <laughs> chill water systems we do, and we don't look at the air handlers, VAV boxes, any of the rest of the air distribution system. So there again, there are multiple levels that we can go farther and farther in our uh, metrics and building modeling where we get to where we can understand more and more. So, so to get there, we've got to get to this building energy modeling. So there's a lot of building energy modeling out there right now. Most of them are, are based on uh, Energy Plus, which was, was a, uh, has a long history uh, of development. Um, there is a new ASHRAE standard out called ASHRAE 205. And ASHRAE 205 has been working uh, to figure out how do we represent equipment in maps. Multi-dimensional maps where I can say the outside temperature and humidity is this, the indoor temperature and humidity is this, my, my indoor space, you know, my load condition is this, how much, how many watts of energy does this, this piece of equipment do and what is its capacity? It's these multi-dimensional maps to do that. And so there is a lot of angst among manufacturers that we don't want to give away all that information because we think we know some secret that our competitor doesn't know. Now, I'm an old guy, I've been in the business for a long time. This is where opinion comes in. I really don't, you know, I can go buy somebody else's piece of equipment, tear it apart, figure out how it works. And by the way, they all do. <laughs> but uh, it's not, there, this isn't, this isn't uh, nuclear science. This isn't brain surgery. This is not that hard. <clears throat> but, you know, it's, it becomes opinions on how much coal, how much compressor, you know, how you play stuff off. But, uh, but people are, are nervous about giving away too much of their technology. So how do, you know, one of the things is how do we put these maps out, but we don't give all the information to our competitors so they can use it against us in a cell. So that's, that's, that's one of the dilemmas on 205, and then just how do we create these maps and then how do we certify these maps? We've got to go to a software type certification program because the only way any, anybody's gonna be able to create these thousands of data points in this multi-dimensional map is not by testing, it's gonna be by modeling. We've got to do tests to confirm it and validate it. We've got to look at the corners, we've got to look at the side, we've got to look at places in the middle, take enough tests that say, yeah, we're." we're on the right track. We know what the controlling factors are, but, but we can't possibly do all the testing because the, right now the test capacity in the United States is to do four data points for 20% of the products every year. That's, that's really the test capacity in the US. <clears throat> and everybody's busy. All the labs are busy and I don't think we're gonna build you know, 50 times more labs in the next 10 years. So if we kind of look at, at uh, this chart on the, on the left, on the right, on your right, is a flow chart of the history of building modeling. It's an eye test, I don't know, I'm expected to read it. But, uh, <clears throat> but it really started back in the 1970s with a US Air Force program called BLAST. <clears throat> and then DOE2 came in in the 80s, Energy Plus came in in the 90s, and that's kind of how, but these are all built on each other. The equipment models, the default equipment models in D D Energy Plus are really the same equipment models that were in BLAST. Not a lot has been done to them since then. I, you know, I've, I've played around with some of these and you, know, you, you can put a 10 compressor unit and a two compressor unit or one compressor unit in there and you know, say it's the same size and model it and it gives you the same energy efficiency. 
Whereas you know that off, nothing's better than off. So, you know, more stages are going to give you better efficiency. But there's, they, they just don't really account for that. <coughs> uh, because they're just, they were just crude, basic things that were developed back in the 70s when we were just barely out of slide rules. So, you know, all these are very simplistic models, so we've got to get a lot, lot better models. Then, then we've got to get that data into 205. You know, you're beginning to see some people provide 205 data for chillers. And then we've got to look at, well, when we put this data on 205, is that map that, two, and this is a chart from the 205 committee, is that map for that uh, data is really covering everywhere this is going to operate? Obviously, it's not going to cover those points that pass the saturation line, but, uh, but 205 right now doesn't even get down to the lower temperatures in, um, <clears throat> on the left and right, so we may not, we may need to expand those maps to, to a bigger place for, for different applications. So, so since two th uh, 2012, HRI has basically been working with this system steering committee, working with all the different H equipment manufacturer section, what we call sections, uh, and now we call sectors at HRI, the people that make different equipment trying to figure out how do we get to certifying maps for all the products across uh, all those. In. And like I said, we've got a couple of things, ERV, uh, uh, energy recovery wheels and plate frame heat exchangers, those basically are mapped at this point. Chillers are mapped at this point. Uh, there's a lot of research projects and things going on for others, but it's, it's, that, it's that humidity thing that makes it really hard, and we haven't really cracked that, that problem. So, so getting that 205 data is another really important thing. The other part of this is we've got to get this building control optimization part in there. So uh, I think we do a pretty good job probably biased because I'm an equipment manufacturer, but I think the equipment we put out is pretty good in general. It could be better if we optimized it for a better range of, of operation and looked at points that looked at its part load efficiency and how it operated we're build, building app, we could do better. But how we control and, and optimize buildings <coughs> is, is even more important because we haven't spent a lot of time on this. You know, we put a control system in, and as a consulting engineer talks to the customer, they say, we're going to operate this building like this, and this is how we design the building, and we set everything up to do that. And then uh, our ASHRAE lady left. I was going to ask her. So <clears throat> I came back in this building a couple of years ago after COVID, right after COVID. I had a meeting in this room, and I took a tour, and I was talking to Jeff Littleton, the executive director here. And I said, well, you know, Got this new ASHRAE headquarters, how's it performing? Well, you know, it's not really performing to the model. You know, it's just not, we're not really using the energy. But guess what? Our people are only coming in two days a week. That's not how this building was designed for. It was designed to come in Monday, work eight hours, come in at eight, go home at five, work 40 hours a week, everybody go home. Now we got two, now we're way underloaded. So the load profile of this building was drastically changed from the internal load because not everybody shows up every day. And that's happening a lot in a lot of places. So how to, did anybody come in and redo all the control systems for that? I'm guessing probably not. <laughs> and is the equipment sized and accommodated for that? You know, I, I spent a short time in my youth, about, through, about five years, working as a contractor, we did a lot of hospital work. If you ever worked in a hospital, I always used, used to say, today's operating, or today's lobby is tomorrow's operating suite. Hospitals are always changing stuff. And that's kind of how buildings are. We're always changing things. Hey, you know, you know those offices? Let's make that a cafeteria, right? And, and, and so, and then some of the last things people think about is the HVAC system that goes into that, or they think about it and do a minimal amount to kind of get it up to code, but not really the operating point. So there's lots of things that can be done in the control world. Uh, and there again, maybe some of this artificial intelligence learning systems, things that will log and, and learn things as the processors get more, and we figure out how to do that. I don't, 
I'm not the guy to do it, but maybe some of you are. Maybe we can get systems that will self-tune and kind of self-regulate, or at least tell people that, hey, this is not optimized. We should look at, at what's going on. The other thing is there's lots, of, you know, we're just not talking about uh, building integration. Now we're talking about, I mean, building equipment integrating. We're integrating the whole services of the building because how the HVAC is affected is dependent on how the lights are, are affected. Maybe the, the water system, the whole energy use of this building has to do with all the energy use. And then bigger than that, what's happening in the community, what's happening at the power generation. Are, if you, if we, like this building, we've got solar collectors. How are the solar collectors uh, load being done? Can we pre-cool spaces and minimize energy when the sun's shining? You know, is there, can we use the thermostat mass of the building to do some things? Or there's lots of integration things we can do. And then we've also got, you know, smart grid. Can we, uh, um, the least efficient generation is the peak generators. The people, you know, I always love uh, Christmas vacation. My, me and my family watch it every year. And when, when the Griswolds throw the light switch on and they have to throw on the nuclear power plant, you know, to, to fire everything. Actually, it wouldn't be the nuclear power plant. It takes a long time to fire. It's a natural gas generator. <laughs> but when they throw that on, that is the least efficient way to, to generate energy. And how can we work with utility people and everything to keep a nice level load, slow ramp ups and slow ramp downs? And can that system talk to our control system and our HVAC equipment while still maintaining comfort in the building for people, which is what our main goal is to, to do. So lots and lots of opportunities to do things. So like I said, I, you know, going forward for uh, especially the young people in the crowd, I'll, I'll be sitting back on the beat. Well, I'll probably still be going to ASHRAE meetings, but, <laughs> but uh, I'll be, I want to watch this as, as uh, in my retirement, but I'm not going to be the guy that could do that. I don't have the tool set anymore to, to do this. This is, this is, uh, but, but getting this more accurately modeled. So I always tell when I talk to student groups or, or uh, I always say, hey, if you're coming into the HVAC industry, look at building modeling, understand building modeling, look at controls, continuous commissioning. Because you designed that building one way, is it still operating that way? And is everything operating or was the secretary on the third floor cold and somebody wired the outside air damper shut and we never un undid that, which has always happened in the history of air conditioning. It's always happened. So, you know, people have done shortcut things when, when something breaks and, and then they forget about it or that guy leaves or he goes off shift or he goes gets a better job and, and no one knows about it. So continuous commissioning of buildings, uh, having controls, having good modeling square foot per year we use in that building. And how do we do that? And give the engineers the latitude and the flexibility to design innovative systems that can meet that and not constrain them by saying, hey, but your fan can't be more than a FEI of, of, one, point, of one or two or whatever the, the latest number is going to be. So uh, <clears throat> you got, you got to give, give people some flexibility because a lot of the metrics and a lot of the things that we do, fan metrics today are rated at full load. Uh, even, even though the, uh, we've got these part load, they're, they're, they're optimized at 75% load, but that 75% load wasn't back down in that operating condition, if you remember on that building, really where it was. Uh, so it's 75% load, but that return air condition probably was considerably different than what we're testing at. So there's, there's lots of different things we could do to, to do that. And that means that the, the metrics are going to get way more complicated. It's not going to be a single number, and it's not something we're just going to print in a table in the ASHRAE handbook and say this is it. Other than we may say we need to be down below so many BTUs per square foot per year or something like that in a, in a total building. It's also going to mean that there's going to be a lot more work going on in the design phase. So we've got to invest more in, in the design and in HVAC. The, if, if you travel around the world, the Europeans typically spend a lot more on their HVAC systems than the US. We spend a lot more on marble and pretty finishes. So 
Uh, <coughs> so, but buildings are more expensive there, but they also last several hundred years. So, um, so I think there's lots of, lots of opportunities there, but we've got to figure out, but we have to kind of solve the, we as the engineering community have to come with a good story to, to go to the regulators and go to the public and say, we are not going to go backwards if we get rid of some of these prescriptive metrics because these prescriptive metrics serve their purpose. They've had their day, but I don't think that, but you're gonna keep driving people to optimize things at, at only the points the, the prescriptive metrics look at because that's just human nature and that's, that's how you, that's the sales process drives that. So there's a whole bunch of opinions. I'd be glad to share some more if somebody had some questions. Uh, what do you guys think? Two no thumbs comments? Up, two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Thumbs up. Uh, I am curious, what do you think is a realistic <coughs> for becoming net zero? You're becoming net zero? Well, you know, it is net. It's not zero. We, I have a net building on our, net zero building on our campus. It's brand new, so I don't know whether it really is, but it's, it's the modeling said it was. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, I don't know. I, th I think the crisis is probably going to hit in 2029. I think long about that period of time, and, and I say 2029, not 2030, because that's the cycle of 90.1. <laughs> so that's the next uh, 90.1 cycle that, that, that will hit. That's the next federal regulatory cycle that will hit. At some point, uh, and we would already hit it with chillers, you know, the U.S. Department of Energy would come in and they would say, hey, hey, folks, we want to increase the efficiency of your chillers. And they're going to say, we can't. We're there. Can't do any more. Not with the metrics you got. I can't do any better. Well, that's not going to be very satisfying to the energy advocates, to the public at large, saying, well, these guys just say they can't do it. We need to find other guys, whoever they are, you know. Uh, but so that's about when that's all going to hit on the majority of, of rooftop equipment, unitary residential equipment, which is 80% of the HVAC market in the U.S. You know, that's when that's all going to hit is about 2029. It might make uh, 32. It, you know, it might make another cycle, but it's not going to be it's not going to be much. There along, somewhere along there, we're going to hit that mass tech, max tech. That doesn't really mean, in my opinion, that we are operating, that we are using the least amount of energy in the building. That just meant that, that we got as good as we could get at four data points. And, uh, and so we got to get, we got to think about it differently. We got to think about it more holistically, more, more as the whole building. And I, I travel around a lot around the country. I talk to a lot of engineers. I'll be spending, you know, Part of my penance for, for Aon paying for my DL trips is, is I go hang out with guys like Tony and, and his rep, rep, my local reps, and I go do lunch and learns. And, and one of the things I always ask engineers is, how much building modeling are you doing? Are you doing building modeling? Is anybody willing to pay you to do that? Which is usually the, the second part of the question. Yeah, we'd like to, but nobody's really willing to pay for it. Uh, you know, unless it's a net zero building or something, it's, unless it's the ego project driven by a big corporation who wants their ESG to look good, but the average run-of-the-mill strip center or school isn't doing that. Uh, so that, you know, to, to, to drive that to net zero, then we got to create incentives to do that, people that want to do that. And more than just want to do it, want to do it bad enough to pay for it because it's going to cost money. And it's going, to cost, it's going to cost the time and effort of everybody in this room to do that. And we all want to be paid for it, right? <laughs> so, uh, I'm yes. I'm, I'm curious because, you know, we're in an exemplary building, and we can point to a few others around, but there's a, the greatest opportunity is not making this building more efficient. It's making some of the buildings down the road that are truly pretty horrible. More efficient, and then how, somebody wanting to do that, too, yeah. right? How, how might we best handle that? I mean, we can ask DOE for regs, but 
Yeah, I, you know, the, the hammer doesn't always work really well, <laughs> you know, so, so uh, there, there are some things that are going on in the corporate world. You know, it's not going to help the mom and pop, it's probably not going to affect the mom and pop restaurant. But uh, there's a movement uh, called ESG. I don't know if any of you guys heard of ESG. Environmental, social, and governance. It's, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the U.S. is starting to pay a lot of attention to it. There are ESG funds you can invest in, feel good funds, you know, basically, that you can invest in companies that have I ESG ratings. Uh, it's, it's a little bit fuzzy and a lot kind of probably misguided at this point, but, uh, you know, it's new. Uh, and, and really, governance is, you know, do I have, do I have board of directors that aren't Imran and going to lose all the investors' money? That's the governance part. Uh, <clears throat> the environmental one's the one that gets lots of play. And they start looking at how environmentally conscious are you all your operations, not only how good are your buildings, how good do they operate, how much do you recycle in that building, and then uh, um, what do they call that? Something three, class three, phase three, something. The, the last one is how, how good are your products at saving energy out, out in the world? So, so that is pushing down on corporate uh, America, so you're, we're seeing that if you work with big corporate clients, a lot of times they, they, they want to do the building modeling. They want to do net zero because that's going to raise their ESG ratings, which will raise their stock price, which will make everybody more money. So there's an incentive to do that. And so, you know, we got to incentivize people to do that. Anytime you do a regulation, it's always going to be a minimum regulation. So you're working to the bottom level of what people are doing. And, you know, you can't, you can't, Bring that up too high or you crash the economy. <laughs> so you can't make everybody go out and say, okay, we're gonna tear down all the old buildings and build these super efficient structures. That's just not gonna happen. But one of the things that ASHRAE did in this building was they took a old, very bad operating building and did a lot of things to make it a whole lot better. Now, you know, there again, once they did that and they looked at the models, their operation changes what they found was the energy wasn't quite what the models matched, but you know that's that's not uncommon. Matter of fact, I think it's. I, I actually haven't ever heard of one that actually matched. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 and then we got you know so the, there. That's the problem I've had in my career with modeling, I, with a lot of modeling people, and you got to be careful about that. It's models save you a lot of repetitive and trial and error and testing because you can do a lot of test symmetry, but you need to test some places because you got to validate it. So you need to look at the operating data. You need to be able to feed your weather data and your operating data back into your model and saying, was this building operating like I thought it was? And that's what Chuck was talking about in his presidential theme. Can we build a digital twin, a computer model that is this operating building? I look at so a computer model that's the operating building and all its aspects of operation, occupancy, weather, and everything else. Look at my real building, look at my utility meter rates at the end of the day and try to get those to match and try to get them to match better. And when they don't match, go looking for why they don't match. And as you know, when the why they don't match is the model's bad, that's not a very good solution. That, that, that's not something that's easy to fix. But once we kind of get the models good, then we can start seeing things. Oh, hey, wait a minute, you know, this, this air handler doesn't look like it's delivering the air. Maybe we ought to go look for a leak in the ductwork. Maybe we've blown out a flex duct up on the third floor. You know, those kind of things that, that you would never find if you didn't have that kind of data back on you. So, and we have tons of data. Right now, we, we are a data-rich world. We have control systems that measure everything. But nobody knows what to do with it. <laughs> Yes. Uh, of course, it is about uh, VRF. Uh, do you think VRF is going to be a good solution today for saving? Every system has its applications. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And, you know, my opinion is I don't build any VRF equipment. Uh, VRF is not for every building, you know. I've, I've run into buildings that were big warehouses that they put 20 VRF units down both sides. That is not a good application for a VRF system. You'd be better off with one big piece of equipment because you're handling what kind of one space. So, you know, I think they all have, I think variable speed technology on compressors, which was driven absolutely off VRF and is pushing its way kicking and screaming in the rest of the HVAC market. Uh, and is the way that we are getting, getting to 2029 on some of this equipment is, is a good thing. It's, but it is very complex. It's very control intensive. And the other problem that we're going to have is we don't have enough technicians in the world to work on any of this stuff. And uh, all the people in my generation told their kids to go to college and not to trade school. <laughs> and so there just aren't those guys out there. And especially in the control stuff, we're going to have to have people that really understand controls and building operators that really are going to have to understand controls and building facilities people that will hire high dollar building operators to, to, to run all this equipment. So there's, there's kind of a paradigm shift. We've got to start paying more. If we want to do it, we can't just buy the equipment and think it's going to work, right? You've got you to keep after it. That's part of that. Committed, continuous commissioning and having these guys in there. So, so what you're saying, the VRF is good for an office or a school or something like that? VRF is good if you have lots of small spaces that have variable loads that you can take, a, take account for large diversity. That's, that's, that's where VRF shines. So, yes? What about A2L refrigerants, lower flammability refrigerants? How do you, what's your crystal ball say about them? Uh, well, there's no crystal ball. They're coming. <laughs> January 1st, 2025. Manufacturers can no longer make anything that doesn't have a, uh, have a uh, re global warming potential less than 700. So uh, there, there's no crystal ball. It's, it's coming. Um, we are, the requirements for doing those flammable, those flammable refrigerants are not very flammable, by the way. Flame spread rate on them somewhere on the order of four inches per second, so you can outwalk it. Uh, uh, not like propane, it's several hundred miles an hour. <laughs> um, but we're putting leak detectors in there, but we never had to put leak detectors in for propane. So, <laughs> so we're going to know that it's happening. So there's a lot of regulatory stuff that's going with it. There's, it's, a, it's a minor bump on the efficiency highway, it's not really causing a big, big problem. What's going to cause problems is how do we go, uh, we don't have chemistry for the middle size equipment for, for high pressure refrigerant, something that replaces R22, 410A, uh, it's going to be 454B or 32 right now, and all the unitary equipment, the vast majority of the market, the residential air conditioner, and the rooftop unit and the, you know, and the air-cooled chiller, all that stuff are running on these high-pressure refrigerants. And if you made them low-pressure refrigerants, then you'd be increasing the equipment size by four or five times because the pipes get great big and, and, and you, it's just harder to move all that mass around. So <clears throat> you have to move more CFM to move more mass with the low-pressure refrigerants. And we don't have anything better than 32 or 32 in its derivatives today. So. Uh, so if any of you want to go out and invent a A2L10 high pressure refrigerant that matches 410A, uh, let me know. I want to invest in your company <laughs> because you're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> but we don't really have it. And I assume if it was easy, somebody would have come up with something. So uh, just looking at the refrigerant, there's a little bit of hit on efficiency, but it's not enough. It's in the noise. It's not enough that's going to matter much. Doesn't really move the, the bar on that max tech thing at all. And uh, my mo bigger concern is, is where are we going to go next? Are we going to have to drop? Probably in the next five years, we're going to have to, or it, by 2030, five years after we enact that, we're probably going to have to drop below 500. And, and then what's the next step? Another five years, we're going to have to drop below 100 or something, or 150. And we don't know what refrigerants we're going to use. That's the biggest problem there. There's not anything there. 
and you know the things that are available to us that, that, that work really good, propane, well, it has a little bit more flammability. Ammonia, great refrigerant, tends to kill people, but other than that, it's a great deal. Uh, CO2, at those kind of temperatures, extremely inefficient. Uh, really good at low temp, not, so, not very good at, at high temp, and has 2,000 PSI inside the pipe, so that's a bit of a problem. You've got a bomb sitting there. So, so they're, they're, they're not really great answers on that refrigerant front. Uh, if we can contain it all in the box and recover it when we're done, do we really have to keep dropping the... That's my personal opinion. Do we really have to keep dropping that? It's, how we save the ozone is we quit spraying R12 out of our aerosol cans into the air. It wasn't when we changed refrigerants, I'm pretty sure. It was mostly that every aerosol can had R12 or R11 in it. So when you put your deodorant on, you created an ozone hole above you. So, <laughs> so, or hairspray or whatever you were using. So, uh, But, you know, if we get caught up in regulations and life goes on. A lot of it becomes more politics than science. Yes, sir. Um, efficiency out of the box is one thing, um, but has there been any thought to uh, say a piece of equipment that is hard to maintain, or what does that look like five years down the road? Or say you make a crap of material, and worse yet, you have to replace it every eight years. Or yeah. you could get a different manufacturer that uses a better product but is <laughs> less efficient out of the box, but has a very consistent profile in terms of overall efficiency over the well, life cycle. Well, you know, so, so, so certain things... As we drive to higher and higher efficiencies, trying to hit those four data points, we've done things like we've made the fin spacing on air-cooled condensers tighter, and then we put lances and louvers in it. We cut little holes and slots in there. Man, do those love cottonwood trees. <laughs> you know, so actually microchannel coils are pretty easy to maintain, and a lot of the industry's gone to microchannel condensers. They have little lances and louvers in there, but they, they don't clog up with cottonwood as bad. They probably still fill up with dirt. And no, I don't think we really know what happens over time because it is all efficiency out of the box. Uh, I know Northwest Labs was playing around with doing some studies on that, but I never heard, I never heard that they finished it or if they finished it, they never published it. So uh, I think there is some, some credibility to doing that. And of course, maintenance uh, uh, of equipment is part of that com continuous commissioning thing. And so if we have all this data, if we have this data rich world, we have control systems, we could be logging and storing that stuff. We could be looking at it over time and seeing, hey, this equipment efficiency is going down. Maybe somebody ought to go look at it and see what we can do. And then, and then, then that'll start driving things like, well, you know, guess what? This is a throwaway coil. After five years, you really need a new one. That's not very popular or very practical, maybe you ought to buy one from the other guy that you don't have to throw away in five years. But how do you, how do you drive that into the marketplace and get owners and uh, customer opinions to, to go that way? I don't know. Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> thank you guys. This was, you were, you were the, uh, other than I did it with Tony and then me and him just talked mostly. <laughs> <laughs> On, on a podcast on YouTube. So if you want to hear it again, you can go listen to that. Uh, uh, but uh, this, is, this was my uh, initial presentation for this, your first meet of the year, the first time I've get, done this presentation. I hope it worked out okay for you. Uh, thank, thank you for inviting me. I always like to come to ASHRAE headquarters. Thank you so much. Same place, same time. Please, uh, we hope you can make it. Uh, topic TBD. So get excited. Anticipation. <laughs> Thank you. You got to figure it out. Huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you so oh, much, Mark. Oh, no problem. That was incredible. So, 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 that introduction is the beginning. Oh, that's okay. But oh my gosh, that was, that was absolutely amazing. And as somebody kind of new to the space, that was a very cool time. Yeah.